Okay, so there we go. Thank you. Now the uh, webinar is being recorded. Um, so let's go back uh, to the, to our beginning slide here. So um, we'll start a little bit uh, uh, a little bit of information about the um, about where we are in the economy, right? Because how the economy is operating will tell us a lot about where the housing market might be going. This chart shows how GDP has changed recently. So GDP, gross domestic product, is a measure of the overall economy. And you can see um, that there's been a pretty modest economic growth uh, in the last few quarters. Q2, uh, we were down. But then the third and fourth quarters of 2022, we actually saw the economy grow by about 3%. That's sort of the long-term average. And it turns out that housing has actually been a little bit of a drag on the economy, meaning if the housing market were stronger, the overall economy would be doing better. And sort of the corollary to that is as the, as the housing market begins to pick up, the overall economy will begin to pick up. The blue lines are a measure of the what's called the residential fixed investment portion of the economy. This includes new construction of homes and apartments. It also includes everything associated with the real estate transaction, property management, um, uh, uh, and uh, and sort of the whole sort of services, as well as the materials associated with the housing industry. And you can see we've been down really pretty significantly for the last couple of quarters. Um, and that is uh, not surprising because we know where the housing market's been. But again, uh, housing is a really important part of the economy. And as it begins to turn around, um, that will actually show up in better overall economic numbers. You know, as I mentioned, the overall economy is growing at about 3% a year. That's, that's sort of the long-term average. And the labor market is actually doing pretty well, right? The, so this is the unemployment rate, both for the U.S. and for New Jersey. Um, it's a pretty dramatic chart in some ways. You can see what happened in March, where the unemployment rate really spiked. This was March of 2020, or sort of March, April, May of 2020. Uh, the unemployment rate has come down very quickly. Um, it's really interesting. It didn't come down quite as quickly in New Jersey as it did in uh, the overall country. But either way, we are back down to really historically low unemployment levels. Um, and um, in the U.S., we hit an unemployment level that we haven't seen since 1969. Um, so very tight labor market, um, which suggests that employers right now are still having trouble hiring people, which means wages are still rising. That that is that is positive news for the overall economy. It's positive news for the home uh, home buying sector as well, because when people feel confident about their jobs and when wages are rising, they're more likely to buy a home. And all this labor market strength has really been sort of surprising, to be to be honest. Uh, we have seen that as inflation has risen, that's that solid line, uh, the Federal Reserve has been raising interest rates in order to try and bring inflation down. And typically, the risk is when the Fed raises the federal funds rate, which raises the cost of borrowing, businesses begin to, to sort of shrink, and they shrink their payrolls, and they lay people off, and the labor market gets negatively impacted. So far, uh, the Federal Reserve um, interest rate hikes have um, begun to bring inflation down, but haven't had um, a major impact on the labor market uh, so far. And um, what, it what we have seen, though, of course, is that as the Federal Reserve has raised short-term rates, we've seen rates uh, for longer-term borrowing, specifically mortgage rates, um, shoot up pretty dramatically. Um, so back in 2000, 2001, early, uh, we saw uh, rates in the 3%. Really, we saw the 30-year fixed rate mortgage rate at a historic low. People were refinancing at 2.5%, buying at 2.7%. There was just so, uh, the rates were so low. Now we're sitting at uh, typical mortgage rates for a 30-year fixed at about 6, 6.5%. Which by historic standards isn't very high, but what happened was rates rose so fast. And in fact, the increase in mortgage rates um, was faster than we've seen in 40 years. And if you look at the box, which has um, sort of typical sort of median home price for the uh, for the local association area, you can see that has a really big impact on 
the monthly payment that a, a home buyer would face. Even as home prices rose a little bit um, year over year, when rates more than double, you can see that the typical monthly payment is up by more than $1,000. And so that really explains a lot of why there was so much pullback in the housing market um, in the second half of 2022. But I will say that um, as we head into 2023, we are starting to see signs that the housing market has uh, started to bottom out, that perhaps buyers and sellers have begun to accept um, what is what is going to be the new normal for 2023. And we've actually started to see buyer uh, traffic begin to um, increase um, in January. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, if we look at where we've been, um, this is data for um, Mercer, Huntington, and Somerset County, so for the core association footprint, and it shows monthly sales over the last few years. The dark orange line or red line is 2022, so last year. Um, and you can see um, sales in the first part of the year were sort of tracking where we were in 2021, 2022, or uh, 2020. Uh, but the uh, pace of home sales activity really declined as mortgage rates increased in the latter half of the year. And year over year, uh, the number of closed sales is still lower than where we were a year ago. Sales down in January, 28.7% um, in the local area. Um, that's not surprising, right? Because we saw so many buyers who were on the sidelines because of higher rates. Um, and we also saw sellers, frankly, pulling back. So inventory was pretty low. Despite the pullback in sort of buyer activity, we still saw that um, at least through the end of 2022, um, home prices were staying pretty stable. In fact, prices were still rising in many local markets. In um, uh, sort of in January, you can see, for example, in the Philly metro area, across the whole mid-Atlantic bright footprint, um, median home prices were still up, you know, four and a half, four point seven percent In the local market, we did see for the for the first time in a while, that the median price in January fell compared to a year ago. And that may be sort of a one-off. Uh, there's it, it depends a lot on the mix of homes uh, sold in any given month. You can see in the chart, though, that uh, really since uh, 2019, um, and then you can see in the middle of the chart is 2020, when home prices were rising at 15, 20, 25 percent year over year, the pace of home price growth certainly has slowed um, in the latter half of 2022. And look, we all knew that that double digit price appreciation was not sustainable. Uh, it was not good for buyers, for sure. And really, it wasn't a, a good pattern for sellers, too, because sellers would find that the sort of quantity of buyers that were able to be in the market um, was so much lower as prices were rising. And so it is really a much healthier market when prices are rising sort of at three, four, five percent year over year, which provides uh, a return to uh, sellers, but also uh, provides access to um, new uh, home buyers and first time home buyers. Um, so if we look, uh, though, a little bit more detail at prices, we have seen and you've probably heard in the media that home prices have fallen from their peaks. So again, the orange line is uh, 2022. And one thing I'll say is, well, that statement is factually accurate, right? Home prices in December are lower than they were at in the peak, which in the core area was in August. But if you look at this chart for the last few years, home prices always fall in the latter half of the year. So Prices do tend to peak in the summer. They tend to fall as we head into the winter. And um, I think in some markets, we're seeing that prices fell off more than would be typical. In, in the local market here, though, the sort of peak to trough uh, price declines are sort of typical of a seasonal pattern. They, they're not like 2020, but 2020 was so unusual. Um, so I would argue that um, as we hear more news um, in the media, it's sort of increasingly important for us to be sharing with our, you know, our prospective buyers and sellers data about the local market, right? Because the national news stories really won't reflect what's going on in the local market. And right now, um, you know, prices appear to be holding uh, more uh, resiliently in uh, your local market than in, frankly, in, in some other markets around the country or even in the mid-Atlantic region. 
One thing that we have seen that does reflect a little bit of a change, but it's a slow change in the market, is that inventory has begun to increase, right? So we can see at the end of the year, for example, uh, across the bright footprint, uh, we have, uh, or I'm sorry, this is at the end of January, uh, across the bright footprint, we've seen that um, inventory was up 40% compared to a year ago. Uh, in the local market, though, inventory is only up 14%. And if you look at the chart, I know I'm throwing a lot of things at you, the table and then the chart, the chart shows a little bit of the longer term picture. And it shows uh, the number of active listings at the end of a month compared to that same month a year earlier. These numbers are all negative, right? <laughs> Over the last three years until we get to the very end of 2022. Inventory has been, been drawn down very quickly. We ended up you know, with historically low levels of supply. And look, I'm not telling you guys anything you don't already know, but what I'm trying to emphasize is even as we're starting to see numbers that suggest inventory is rising year over year, we started from such a low level that we're going to find ourselves in a 2023 market where inventory is still relatively low. And uh, buyers are really going to uh, outnumber sellers um, and as we may feel like it's moving a little bit more towards a more typical housing market, um, it will still be decidedly a seller's market, in, uh, particularly in your local market where um, inventory is still quite tight. Um, we'll have to keep an eye on that, though. That new listings is sort of what we want to keep an eye on. Um, the reason why I think that uh, inventory is going to stay pretty low is, you know, there are a lot of existing homeowners who refinance during those historically low mortgage rates and are sitting on rates at two and a half, maybe three percent. Um, they don't want to sell because they're going to have to trade in that uh, super low mortgage rate for something more like six or six and a half percent. And that's a, that's even if they can find something to buy. Uh, so, you know, I do think more uh, sellers will be coming sort of out of the woodwork and and making that uh, taking that hard decision to uh, to go ahead and list their home and take on a, a mortgage with a higher rate. But there's going to be a lot of people who are going to say, you know, I'm not going to move unless I absolutely have to. And that's going to keep inventory low uh, really for much of 2023. And I think even for a couple of years beyond that. I do think we're going to see signs that the housing market is going to return uh, to some more normal or typical conditions. And, and one thing that I think is, is changing, and we're seeing that play out in markets across the mid-Atlantic, is you know homes are staying on the market a little bit longer. Buyers are being a little bit more deliberate. Uh, it is a good thing for the housing market, for the median days on market to be increasing. Uh, you can see in January, uh, the median days on market hit 24. Uh, that was up six days from where almost a week longer than where we were a year ago. If you look back to where median days on market was back in 2019, for example, you know, 25, 35, 45 days it took typically for a home to sell. And we're still way below that. So again, the market is changing really quickly and these changes seem really dramatic compared to where we were during the pandemic housing market, but we're still um, seeing a very sort of fast moving market. Um, there's a question about whether the charts are for the core footprint or for the Philly area. I am so sorry, I wasn't clear. All of the charts are for the core association footprint. The table is for reference so you can see how the core association looks relative to Philly and the Bright region uh, during the given month. So the charts are all uh, for the local association. Um, if I had plotted uh, the Philly metro area on this chart, it would look very similar. Um, there are some markets where days on market has really shot up. In D.C., where I'm based, uh, the Washington area saw that the median days on market in January was 30. And we haven't been in, at 30 since um, back in 2018. So in some markets, uh, it's changing quite a bit. So uh, this only includes the three counties. Core Association only includes the three counties in these charts. So a good thank you for that clarification. Um, when uh, when we finish, uh, I'll have a slide that has a, uh, a screenshot of where you can get all of our monthly housing market reports by metro area, and you can get the full slate of Philadelphia metro area reports there. In the future, um, if you know I get a chance to come back and talk with you guys, if having uh, stats on the Philly market sort of separated out would be helpful, happy to do that. Uh, just wanted to make sure I did give you the most local picture I could since things are looking a little bit different in your local market than they are um, in the uh, in the um, in the uh, uh, metro area. 
Um, so the question is, how is the core association plus six days when the counties are only five or plus four? That's a great question, Judson. That's like, a, I love these questions that say why the math doesn't seem to work. And it really has to do with how um, the mix of sale, how many transactions there were across those three counties this year compared to where they were last year. That core number is really a weighted average. And if uh, they were weighted differently with, say, more sales in uh, Mercer County, you could actually see the core association sort of change look a little bit different. If you look at the January number, though, you can see that core association number sort of falls in between where the counties are. So that's a good question. And it's those kind of questions that keep me um, like always puzzle me as well. Um, and it in this case has to do with the mix of homes uh, uh, changing across the three counties over the, the two years. Um, you know, uh, one thing I think that uh, oh yes, there's great. There's a great question about um, seeing list prices as well as sold prices. I'm so glad you mentioned that. We haven't been tracking that, and I think that's a big missed opportunity going forward. Um, when we put out our monthly reports and our weekly reports, we're going to begin to introduce. And weekly is going to be particularly interesting to look at list prices. Uh, we're going to begin to introduce list median list price um, as one of our metrics that we follow because, as you're right, you're so right. Um, looking forward is what we want to be doing. Looking backwards at uh, what homes closed at is less relevant as we're trying to predict where the market's headed. You know, one thing I want to emphasize is, you know, we hear a lot about buyers pulling back, but one thing that makes this particular um, housing market slowdown pretty unique is that we've seen both buyers and sellers uh, pulling back uh, from the market at the end of 2022. Look, you know, most people who sell a home are also a buyer, so they are also feeling um, the constraint of low inventory and the, you know, affordability challenges associated with higher prices and rising mortgage rates. Um, so we can see, for example, the red line shows monthly new pending sales across the local market, the core association. Uh, in December, uh, you know, we hit the lowest level since 2014 in terms of uh, new pending sales. It really fell off a cliff. You know, I do think that, you know, when rates hit 7% back in November, there were some prospective buyers who had been out in the market and they saw that and they're like, I don't know, maybe just threw up their hands and said, let's just get 2022 behind us. You know, we had a lot of, we saw the same thing on the seller side where um, sellers had listed their home, rates uh, went up, buyers pulled back, sellers uh, withdrew their listings at sort of record levels. And in fact, I don't even have data um, uh, back before 2013 uh, in a good way way. So uh, I actually can't say exactly when the last time the December new listings number was lower than it was this past December. But um, the reason why this is important, right, is there's a lot of talk out there about, I mean, there's still a lot of talk, and I'm really surprised about this, still a lot of talk that home prices might crash, that the market might collapse. But if, if supply is being pulled back faster than demand, me meaning sellers are, are uh, are pulling back faster than buyers are leaving the market. That means that the sort of the balance is still sort of um, how it has been for the last few years. More buyers than there are sellers. Um, prices um, will continue then to at the very least be stable um, and continue to rise in some markets. Um, I think there's this um, you know this sense that uh, you know prices have to come down as mortgage rates went up, and and that's true. We're, we're, we saw that as mortgage rates went up, there were fewer, of course, multiple offers. There were um, you know fewer offers over list. There was um, more uh, buyers had more leverage on price, and we're starting to see that you know when that average sold to list price ratio really skyrocket, well, I don't know if skyrocket's the right word, but really increased, meaning that on average back in you know the summer, uh, homes were getting 4% more than they were listed for. Um, we've started to see that trend um, come back down. I believe we'll start to um, see this sort of average sold to list price ratio get back down to kind of more historic levels where, uh, but, but sellers are also getting better. We, we've been watching um, the share of listings with a price drop We've, we've watched that share actually get smaller. And what that means to me is that sellers are uh, adjusting to the new market and are pricing their house a little bit better. But there will be more negotiation between buyers and sellers, and we will see 
um, in general, uh, sold prices be below uh, list prices um, simply because uh, buyers do have a little bit more leverage um, because higher rates have put added pressure. You saw that the typical monthly payment is now $1,000 more than it was uh, last year at this time. So what does that mean as we kind of look ahead? So it's sort of this characterization of this sort of market really contracting at the end of 2022 uh, amidst higher mortgage rates, both buyers and sellers sort of taking a wait and see approach. But as I mentioned, we've begun to see in our January data uh, where we track the housing market on a weekly basis, we started to see buyers back in the market. We started to see uh, showings increase. We started to see even new contract activity pick up. Um, sellers are actually sort of lagging buyers, so we're still seeing uh, inventory pretty low. One thing I will say as we sort of move through this housing cycle is it's just important to remind ourselves and frankly to remind maybe um, uh, buyers and sellers who are in the market that, uh, you know, this is not 2008, right? This is not... Um, when we hear about a transitioning housing market or um, a housing market recession was even talked about a lot, uh, people immediately will think back to the last financial crisis and the last housing market downturn. But there are so many ways in which the market we're in now is just dramatically different from where we were back in 2005, 6, 7, 8. Uh, the biggest difference, well, there's, I mean, all of these are really important, but there's still very low inventory, whereas back in 2008, inventory was rising really fast. Builders were, had, didn't pause new construction activity and were still building uh, new developments really quickly. Uh, right now, there's also virtually no subprime lending in the market, whereas those of you working in the market back 15 years ago know that, you know, there's rampant sub subprime lending, which really set buyers up for um, uh, for financial uh, difficulties, which led to a flood of foreclosures and short sales in the market. Uh, we don't see any evidence of rising significantly rising foreclosure rates um, in any of our markets, uh, and most of our markets. Um, and even if uh, foreclosure rates do rise, they're still they they're still really low. We're still a little bit below where we would be long term. Um, and so foreclosures aren't going to begin to flood the market. The labor market, as I mentioned, is strong. Whereas 15 years ago, we had you know people concerned about their jobs with unemployment on the rise. And while home prices were up really quickly over the last few years, um, you know we had one year where prices shot up 50% back during the last housing market uh, run up. So um, we are definitely going to see some markets where prices are going to continue to come down from peak levels. We're going to see some markets where there are year over year price declines, um, but there's going to be a lot of places where prices are going to hold firm and may even continue to rise. And as we look ahead, uh, there are you know, reasons to think that um, during this housing market reset, which is what I've been calling it, that you know, demand is going to remain um, pretty strong. The demographic and economic fundamentals are actually pretty strong uh, to support uh, home buying activity. Um, people who are existing homeowners, like repeat buyers, move up buyers, they're in the best position uh, with... Um, you know, a, a lot of equity to roll into the purchase of a new home. First time buyers, you know, who sort of in that millennial population age 27 to 41, um, the typical uh, age of a first time home buyer is in sort of the mid 30s. There's a big group of folks in that prime first time home buyer age, um, and they will be in the market for the next three, five, seven years. Uh, it's going to be challenging for first time buyers, and I'll talk more about affordability in just a minute. Um, but uh, the sheer numbers suggest that um, that demand will continue to be strong. Uh, rates have mortgage rates have started to ease a bit. I think uh, there's just going to be more acceptance of the new normal of six percent rates. Uh, price negotiations are going to take that into account, and um, and uh, and buyers are going to have to bring a little bit more to the table. Now, there are risks, of course, going uh, into 2023, and a lot of it depends on where you are and about the local market. Affordability is a big one. You know, we saw some places where affordability became a, a really huge challenge. Um, if you imagine a place like Los Angeles, the median home price in Los Angeles is 11 times the median household income. Uh, by comparison, in the Philadelphia metro, the median home price is only about four and a half times the median household income. So in fact, much of the mid-Atlantic, even the high cost uh, DC market, affordability is not as big a challenge as it is in some of those West uh, coast markets. 
Um, and those are the places where I think we're going to see greater prices, uh, price depreciation. Zoom towns, right? Those towns that really sort of boomed during the pandemic as people were working and learning remotely and now are seeing demand really pull back. That's where we're seeing some price resetting. Places where inventory is rising. Um, new construction will be a sort of a wild card if they're... Um, are places where builders hit pause on new construction, but then um, have a lot of new product to release into the market in 2023. That could um, sort of change the dynamic in terms of um, pricing in local markets. And then the last thing I'll say, and I kind of alluded to this a little bit, is you know we saw during the pandemic that you know uh, the economic downturn and the pandemic at large sort of hit people differently and really sort of. Um, shown a spotlight on some of the inequality in our economy and our society. That's going to be true in the housing market, frankly, going forward. If you are an existing homeowner, uh, you have record levels of housing wealth and equity in your home. You have choices about you know, whether to move, even if rates are still high. Um, the challenge um, has been... Um, the, the, cha the challenge has been uh, for new first-time home buyers who were competing with so many different people during the last few years. Um, and unfortunately, even as prices you know, begin to ease a little bit, affordability for first-time home buyers is still going to be pretty challenging. So we've seen you know, first-time buyers start to get creative, you know, uh, uh, buying a uh, duplex, living in one, renting out one, uh, buying a home with family members, um, or frankly, just waiting uh, to save up. The rental market has expanded a little bit in some, uh, in some markets where there's more rental options. So first-time buyers are still um, going to face challenges and um, are still going to find, um, find it really tough. Um, that's, of course, where working with a local realtor uh, is more and more important, is more important than ever, um, to help find ways to, um, to uh, move, uh, move through uh, the market. So there's a question about, you know, many towns are reevaluating homes using 2021 prices, raising taxes, uh, any input on future taxes. Oh my gosh, talking about taxes. That's really interesting. So, so when they go and do property assessments, um, you know, the assessors have to make use of the data that they have. And in a changing housing market, that's really tricky, isn't it? I would argue that if you're, you know, if if you have gotten an assessment based on 2021 um home prices, I would go through the appeal process and find out and bring bring the data, right? And bring the information that you can to try and um, you know, get your assessment lowered. Uh, I did that one time. Um, it 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 didn't make that much of a difference, but it was satisfying, right? Because it was, um, you know, being assessed reflecting a market that was sort of, you know, two years ago. Um, and I think that's going to be true even as you help uh, sellers list their homes. You know, what? How many months back can you go to look for comps um, in order to help? Uh, list the property um, and really sort of being flexible and thinking about um, maybe being a little bit more conservative uh, than uh, sellers have been in the last few months because the 2023 market, while prices aren't going to be crashing, it is going to be uh, the prices are going to be a lot more flexible in 2023 than they were in 2021, and in some markets, um, you know, overall median prices will will even be lower than they were in 2021. One more just point on that is even if we do see prices fall, uh, home values will still be above where they were usually by a lot uh, before the pandemic. So we're seeing like in the Philly metro area, um, home prices have eased from the peak, but they're still 30 percent higher than they were in, in 2019, for example. Um, and um, I think that's important for us to remember as we're talking with maybe with prospective buyers who might be worried, I don't want to buy now because I think um, prices are going to keep falling um, because I've seen what's happened over the last six months. Um, it's important to remember that if you're buying a home to live in for three, five, seven years, the, the typical length of time now is about 11 years, um, that the appreciation is, you know, is pretty cons is consistent across time, meaning that uh, people who do purchase a home to live in for that length of time uh, do see it as a good financial investment. And looking back at the last six months, it's actually really misleading. Uh, it's just too short of a time horizon. 
So in November, we put together a forecast for 2023. Um, there's a ton of numbers on this chart, uh, but I think the most important really are sort of uh, on the, the right-hand side. This is the number of home sales that are predicted for, let's look at the 2023 row, that light blue. Um, so our forecasts are for there to be um, about 4.865 million home sales nationally in 2023. That's the first time we're going to see um, home sales below 5 million since uh, uh, more than a decade ago. And in some ways, you, you might say, well, Lisa, that sounds really scary. That sounds like the market's really still contracting. Part of it is we saw so many um, buyers sort of push their home purchase forward. Look at that 2021 number where we had over 6.1 million transactions nationally. So a lot of people who might have been in the market in 2023 have actually already made their home purchase. And so imagine a pendulum. We, we, swang this, we, we, we swung this way in 2021. We have to come back a little bit before we begin to reset to more typical um, you know, pace of home sales transactions. You can see across the uh, bright footprint, home sales down 4.6% in 2023 um, in the Philly metro area, a little bit softer um, in terms of the decline in transactions. The Philadelphia market has um, a lot of things going for it, one of which is that affordability issue I mentioned. Compared to the top 50 metropolitan areas, you know, Philadelphia ranks you know, third in terms of the best affordability, um, and that makes it an attractive location. Even Baltimore and D.C. are, are in uh, sort of the, the, the top third in terms of affordability, um, and so the housing market, while it will be a little bit slower in 23, uh, won't decline as fast as it will in some other local markets. I do expect that um, you know, prices uh, were up double digits in 2020, 2021. Um, overall, in the bright footprint, home prices up uh, pretty significantly in 2022. And I expect that there's going to be some markets that uh, prices will fall, some markets where prices are going to rise. But overall, uh, we're looking at a median price that will be pretty flat year over year. Um, and I think that is um, sort of trying to balance this you know, higher rates uh, need to put downward pressure on prices, but demand is still high and supply is still low. So that's going to continue to uh, create activity in the market. So um, overall, um, nationally, prices are expected to be flat and across our footprint, including in the Philly metro area where we have expectations of home prices up, you know, just 1% year over year. Um, you know, there are some places across our footprint where there are sort of greater risks of home prices falling. So this is the MLS footprint. It's a little fuzzy, a little, sorry, it's a little um, hard to read in some places. I need to uh, make a more, uh, a sharper map, but you can see uh, the footprint runs from New Jersey up north down to central Virginia. And, you know, the places in red are places that are at greater risks of prices falling, like year over year uh, falling. Uh, and those are places where uh, that includes second home markets. You can see um, in uh, Maryland and Delaware, uh, for example, on uh, the, the, uh, at the beach. Um, some of those uh, second home markets are starting to see softer price prices and prices coming down. We saw in, in places uh, in some of the exurban fringes that were really booming during the pandemic where demand has really shrunk and we're seeing prices that are coming down quite quickly. Um, but, but you know, if you look up uh, in uh, your local market, just see very little risk of prices coming down. Um, in fact, you know, the major metro areas tend to look pretty good. We've seen really strong demand in um, suburban markets. It's been a little bit trickier in, in basically in downtown Philly and in Baltimore and DC proper. We've seen a little bit um, slower return of buyers to the city markets, but um, very um, uh, relatively strong return of buyers to suburban markets. And you know, I think as we uh, go forward, keeping an eye on these local markets, um, paying attention to what's going on on the ground, even at the neighborhood level, will be uh, really important to gauging, you know, where prices might be headed. So as we sort of wrap up here, you know, what does this all mean, right? Uh, what, you know, what kinds of things uh, do I think this means for buyers, for sellers, and, and for the industry? Um, I do think that, you know, there's going to be a lot of talk about where rates are headed. And, you know, if anyone 
tells you they know exactly where mortgage rates are headed, I would take it all with great assault. Um, I do think in the short term, we're going to start continue to see mortgage rates kind of in that six to six and a half percent range. We've already seen buyers accepting that sort of as the new normal. Um, I think it, it is an opportunity for uh, realtors to kind of re-educate buyers about what uh, what a normal rate is, uh, particularly for those who have only been in the market for the last couple of years and all they've seen are 3% mortgage rates. Um, this is a great opportunity to sort of re-educate uh, re-educate um, uh, their buyers. Loans and uh, terms and rates vary a lot across lenders. They they typically vary, but uh, now even more, it makes sense for buyers to be shopping, uh, shopping rates and terms. Buyers will have more leverage on price and they will have more leverage on concessions. We've started to see seller concessions back uh, rising to more than, you know, getting back up to more than half of uh, transactions. I think there's going to be less co competition from investors and cash buyers. I think those investors have uh, other places now to put their money as the economy is improving. Um, inventory is still going to be low and, and buyers do still need to be ready. Like all this talk about the market slowing makes it sound like buyers are going to sort of uh, be in charge. But uh, unfortunately uh, for buyers, um, you know, it is still going to be a seller's market um, in most in most places. But it is going to be a new kind of market for sellers. I think sellers should, if you know someone's been waiting, thinking, I don't want to list my home. I don't know if there are any buyers out there. Um, sellers should expect an uptick in buyer traffic, particularly as rates stabilize and come down a, a little bit more. Pricing is critical, right? What we're seeing is that when sellers price their home appropriately, you know, reflecting current market conditions, homes are still selling pretty quickly. Um, and so take time to prep the home for sale. Be prepared for the buyer to come back uh, and to want to negotiate um, and, and to ask even for closing cost assistance and certainly for home inspections and all those things that sort of went out the window during the pandemic. Um, it's going to be more of a negotiation than it has been in the past. And then lastly, I do think that, you know, for agents and brokers, you know, this is an opportunity to really demonstrate the value a local real estate professional brings to the transaction. Right. I, I know uh, it's, it was just such a frenzied couple of years. In some ways, it was sort of almost hard to demonstrate that value. Um, but now more than ever, uh, it's so important to be a resource on local market conditions um, to help dispel maybe some myths in the market um, and to um, demonstrate uh, the value that you guys bring to your clients and to your colleagues. Um, and to your community. And so there's a few questions here. I'm just going to take a pause here. Do you have different advice for realtors depending on which of the three core counties they focus on? And that's a great question. And I do think that, you know, you can see, uh, you know, Mercer County sort of the, the big one in, in the three markets. And I, I would argue that when you're watching trends in some of the smaller markets, kind of looking back at more data is going to be um, really important. So don't don't sort of um, don't sort of gauge too much on one month of sales activity if we're only looking at a handful of sales. Um, so uh, I would I would argue that um, you know as we sort of try and better understand where people are moving to and moving from, um, and being able to um, you know really sort of understand local market conditions is going to be really important. Unfortunately, I you know I I have. Um, I have to say, I think that there are just sort of in general being being this local resource is going to be important no matter where where you're operating. And so then the second question is, do you mean rate six and six and a half percent for the remainder of calendar year 2023? Yeah, you caught me on that, didn't I? I didn't specify. I in my forecast, I have uh, the 30 year fixed rate mortgage rate at six percent at the end of calendar year 2023. I did those forecasts back in November. I think it's possible rates will fall below 6% by the end of the year, but I think they're going to stay in the 6 and 6.5% 6 range really through Q1, maybe into Q2, um, as the Federal Reserve continues to raise interest rates and inflation is still sort of higher than that uh, that that uh, baseline level that the Fed wants. So 6, 6.5% for the beginning of the year, maybe falling further. Look, and you're saying, should I should I tell a buyer to wait for rates to come down even further? I think that's a dangerous game, to be honest with you. If there are buyers who are ready to be in the market now, um, I think watching, um, you know, where rates are going, maybe trying to um, sort of um, 
you know, lock in um, because there's a lot of fluctuation in rates right now, um, sort of lock in when you do see a dip in rates, um, because there are no guarantees as the last three years have told us um, in terms of where rates or the housing market are going to go. There's another question here about um, thoughts on the rental market. Great question. I don't have, we don't have as good data on the rental market, uh, to be perfectly honest with you, as we do on the for sale market. And so I don't, um, I, I don't have specific data on your local market. Um, so I will make a note, I'm gonna make a note. Um, you know, I think that would be good to begin to introduce in some of these presentations, but we have seen generally that um, the stock of rental housing has actually increased in some places pretty dramatically. We're starting to see rents come down um, we're starting to see land uh, property managers offering, you know, uh, two months free rent. We're starting to see that there's more competition in the rental market. And so um, while rent growth sort of went through the roof last year, I, I do think that as we head through 2023, this, this um, new inventory that's been coming online on the rental side is actually starting to have an impact on, on rents. And we're starting to see in many local markets that rents are coming down. A uh, question here about what advice would you provide to a cash buyer when decent houses are getting 10 good offers after last and finals over asking? Um, I feel like if you're a cash buyer, you still have some leverage, right? Um, uh, for for uh, Against people who are working through um, a financing contingency, for example. Um, and so I think that cash buyers are still in a relatively... A good position. It's interesting that you say that houses are still getting 10 offers. And um, I imagine you're, you mean even now. And I think that's really important for us to remind folks that we, we keep hearing that the market's slowing, but from folks like yourself and in other local markets that I've had a chance to talk with people, um, we're back to multiple offers and it's the same rules apply, you know, make your offer as attractive as possible. And, um, and, and again, if you're a, a cash, a cash buyer, it feels like you do have an advantage over those who are um, potentially um, going um, uh, through the financing process. And yes, the comment, yes, because there's no inventory. Look, it all comes back to inventory. In some ways I'm like, it's kind of, depressing that we're still talking about inventory being the major constraint on the market after all this mortgage rate discussion kind of derailed those conversations. But um, we are still seeing that inventory is going to be the constraint on the market and uh, the number of sellers is going to be lower than the number of buyers. And that is going to create competition, um, as you all are, are rightly pointing out. I'm happy to continue to take questions, but I did want to make sure that I... Um, made you aware of the resources that are available on Bright MLS's website. If you go to the research section, we do produce weekly market reports. Um, right now we're doing them at the state level. So New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Delaware, um, but uh, hopefully to move to a more of a local regional Metro uh, reporting in the next few weeks. But this takes a look back at, you know, what happened last week in terms of showings, new contracts, new listings, um, really sort of to give a, that's the like, that's kind of the, the pace at which you want to see data right now because things are changing so fast. We do issue monthly reports. And so um, I do recommend you taking a look at them. But it's like I said, we're, those backward looking reports are really helpful um, in some ways, but but um, they some, miss some of this like more immediate stuff that's going on in the market. But we put our, our monthly reports around the 10th of the month. So they'll be out tomorrow. Um, and we do it for the three metro areas and the bright footprint overall. We also break out um, some local, uh, other local markets like Central PA and um, and uh, the Southern Maryland and Eastern Shore, those kind of places. We have um, blogs. If you like your if you like your data and infographics, we have infographics. If you like your analysis in blogs, we have 300 to 500 blogs on different topics. Um, the Home Demand Index is a great resource. Uh, provides a forward looking um, picture of the market where buyer activity is slowed, where it might be getting to pick up. You can look at it at the zip code level. And then as always, if you ever have any questions or you think, oh, I'd like to know if this data are available or am I looking at this right? You know, don't hesitate to reach out um, anytime. I'm happy to uh, be a resource um, at any point. Um, so just go through some of the comments here and then um, I will... Uh, turn it back over, but um, I just, there's a comment about receiving notice. I just received notice this morning that the two bedroom condo my buyers offered on Sunday had 14 offers, 14 offers with several cash contracts. 
See, I think that's what's missing in some of the sort of general media reporting about the market is that at the local level for certain kinds of properties in certain local markets, and I think your local market is a very good example of it, um, in some ways, things have not didn't slow down at all. And, uh, and we'll be seeing um, a very competitive market for buyers in 2023. Um, Anne asked, can you briefly talk about the home demand index for those who are unaware? Yes, thank you for um, bringing that up. I will, uh, let me, um, I'm going to go through the rest of the questions. I'm going to pull up my uh, browser and I can show you um, in my browser. Um, and then the question is, is this same information available for core as in uh, Bright for monthly reports? Unfortunately, Jan, we don't report out at the local association level. If you have access to um, smart charts, um, which is at getsmartcharts.com. Uh, that has um, all of a ton of detailed data on um, the local association markets um, all organized. But our monthly reports um, don't uh, get reported out by local association and not by county. Although that's not true, actually. So uh, we do in the like for the Philly metro area, for example, we report out the county level data in the metropolitan area reports. We don't have individual reports for counties, but again, smart charts will. Question is, can we receive these reports as an affiliate of CORE? All of the reports that you see on this page right here, open to the general public. You don't have to be a bright MLS subscriber. You don't have to be a real estate agent, you anyone. So these are all available out there. Um, there's of course a lot of other analysis and reports and data that are available through Matrix to Bright subscribers, but this stuff out here is all in um, is all available to the to the public. Um, I'm going to stop. Well, I'm going to say thank you, right? So there's a thank you slide here. Thank you, and then I'm going to stop my share uh, for just a second. And um, I think the um, there was a question about the home demand index. And again, for those of you who have to hop off, you know, uh, I, I won't be offended. Um, but let me um, let me share um, my screen one more time. Uh, this is the home demand index. It's just uh, homedemandindex.com. And um, it is uh, a joint venture from Bright and T3. It allows you to look at um, data at uh, a pretty um, low level of geography um, and allows you to sort of drill down into what's going on at the local level. So let me just get into the Philly metro area here. Um, what you can see here is county data and the um, index for each county is listed here. And you you can read about this in on the website, but basically any county that's blue um, is where buyer traffic has uh, really slowed down. Uh, the index is based on data on showings as well as new purchase contracts. And it is also based on data about um, uh, property views, agent views and um, public views of properties in the local market. So all of those sort of pre-sales activities come together to form this index, and it gives you a picture of what buyers are doing in the market now before an offer comes in, right? It gives you kind of a heads up. So I would watch this. You might start to see that you know some of these counties might start to turn pink here in the next month, and that sort of and expects that you know um, buyer activity is beginning to pick up a little bit. If I click on Mercer County, I think it's going to be a little bit boring. Yeah, it's all blue. It's all limited, <laughs> but you can see there might be some differences across the counties by zip code, and then you're able to, um, and then you're able to. Uh, um, let me go see if I can find another county. You're able to then pick up um, some local differences that you can share with buyers and sellers to help them sort of understand um, how things might be um, operating differently. All right, here's Montgomery County, just as another example. So you can see there are some markets zip codes where um, that home, home demand index suggests traffic is, is quite low, uh, showing activities low, uh, uh, views in those markets are low. But then there are some markets where, uh, and some zip codes where you can see stronger um, buyer activity. And that would be some information you could take to a prospective seller and say, hey, we noticed uh, you know, based on th these forward-looking data that, you know, in, your, in the zip code that you're located in, there's actually sort of moderate levels of buyer activity, and it's up from last month, um, and it really provides sort of a, a picture that you really can't get anywhere else. I think that's sort of the, the key because it's sort of, it's that pre-sales activity before, um, you know, before any uh, 
uh, transactions. Blue means lower buyer demand, orange is higher buyer demand. Yes, sorry. Um, that is true. And, and you can see there'll be like a little, um, uh, like a little temperature thing on the on the website. So um, uh, that is all I have uh, for you today. As we mentioned, we recorded this. And so we will be sending the recording out to the local association. And um, we will also send the PowerPoint presentation out to your local association. Um, we can um, uh, also distribute the uh, local, uh, the PowerPoint out to uh, folks who registered for the event. Um, and then, as I said, if you have any questions at all, uh, you can always reach out to me. Uh, I am at, uh, you are uh, the reason that I do my job. So uh, please don't hesitate. Um, and with that, you know, have a great day. Uh, uh, best of luck for a, uh, a spring market as we head into the next few weeks. Take care.